at kpfa.org. This is a rude awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. On today's show, I'll speak with Dr. Allison Van Enenam about genetically modified salmon, friend or foe. Dr. Tyler Sutterly about the melting ice sheets in Greenland. And we'll close the show out with investigative environmental reporter for the Real News Network, Mr. Steve Horn. He's back to discuss his latest piece on the California wildfires and prison labor. But first, the news. I'm Eileen Alcindary with KPFA News Headlines. A day after President Trump accepted the Republican presidential nomination without mentioning police violence against black Americans and the deprivation of other rights, thousands are gathering in Washington, D.C. with a laser focus on those very issues. Today, the Reverend Al Sharpton, Martin Luther King Jr., Benjamin Crump, and the families of the most recent Emmett Hills have called us here to do something about criminal justice, to do something about voter suppression, and to say once and for all, get your knee off our necks. The event is taking place at the steps of the Lincoln Memorial, where the Reverend Martin Luther King Jr. delivered his historic I Have a Dream speech on this date in 1963. The backdrop for the march is renewed outrage and protests following the police shooting of Jacob Blake, a 29-year-old father of six. The injured man's uncle said Blake's father had visited him in the hospital and was heartbroken to see his son handcuffed to the hospital bed. Uncle Justin Blake said this is an insult to injury. He is paralyzed and can't walk, and they have him cuffed to the bed. Why, he asked. The white 17-year-old charged in the killing of two protesters in Kenosha faces his first court appearance today. Prosecutors have filed five felony charges against Kyle Rittenhouse. He could face a mandatory life sentence if convicted of first-degree intentional homicide. Rittenhouse apparently answered the call of right-wing militia members to come to Kenosha to protect property from damage during protests over Blake's shooting. President Trump travels to New Hampshire today, a day after accepting the nomination in a 70-minute speech. An estimated 1,500 guests attended. Sitting shoulder to shoulder, the vast majority wore no mask at a time the coronavirus pandemic is spreading widely and killing 1,000 people a day in this country. Trump blasted Joe Biden as a weak career politician who'll give free reign to violent anarchists, agitators and criminals who Trump said threatened the populace. Lily Bulky reports. President Donald Trump capped the Republican National Convention with an acceptance speech full of misleading claims and exaggerated attacks. Fear-mongering was a common thread throughout the evening. No one will be safe in Biden's America. We launched the largest national mobilization since World War II. I have done more for the African-American community than any president since Abraham Lincoln. Several speakers blamed Joe Biden and Democrats for the protests that have been ignited by police shootings and the subsequent violence in Kenosha, Wisconsin and other cities. Yesterday, Biden responded with a reminder that, quote, the violence we're witnessing today is under Donald Trump, unquote. At a counter event held by anti-Trump Republicans calling themselves principled conservatives, television pundit Tara Setmeyer condemned all violence and criticized the Trump campaign for not doing the same. They're not talking about the white militia 17-year-old who decided to go out and shoot some protesters the other night and murder two people. Trump delivered his speech from the South Lawn of the White House. Fireworks spelled out his name on the National Mall. I'm Lily Bolke. Firefighters slowly increased the containment lines around the three major blazes burning in the San Francisco Bay Area and Santa Cruz. 35% containment for both the LNU North Bay Bay Blaze and CSU SCU East Bay Fire. They're the second and third largest wildfires in state history. The Santa Cruz San Mateo CZU Blaze was 24% contained. The three wildfires combined have burned 1,277 square miles. The cooler weather with higher humidity has provided better firefighting conditions and allowed large numbers of evacuees to return home. 
about 50,000 in the last two days alone. Despite the progress, Cal Fire's LNU Unit Chief Shauna Jones said firefighters were still actively fighting fires locally and statewide. So while first responders continue to battle um, the fires here in the LNU complex, new fires continue uh, to be reported daily, locally, and throughout the state. Since August 15th, 700 new fires have been reported throughout the state. 46 new starts just yesterday. Today, more than 1.6 million acres have burned since August 15th of this year. That's 2,500 square miles burned in California since August 15th. The remnants of Hurricane Laura unleashed heavy rain and tornadoes hundreds of miles inland after leaving at least six dead, mangled buildings and entire neighborhoods in ruins along the Gulf Coast. Forecasters warned of new dangers as the tropical weather blows toward the eastern seaboard this weekend. More than 750,000 homes and businesses were without power in Louisiana, Texas, and Arkansas. Laura was one of the strongest hurricanes ever to strike the U.S., coming ashore in Louisiana as a Category 4 storm with 150-mile-per-hour winds. A massive plume of smoke visible for miles began rising from a chemical plant in the city of Lake Charles, Police said the leak was at a facility run by Biolab, which manufactures chemicals used in household cleaners and chlorine powder for pools. Nearby residents were told to close their doors and windows. India has recorded another high of more than 77,000 new coronavirus cases in the past 24 hours. Neha Punya reports from New Delhi. More than 77,200 people tested positive in India in the last 24 hours, pushing the total cases past the 3.3 million mark. The country has also recorded more than 1,000 new deaths, taking the total death toll to over 61,000. India is currently the worst affected country in Asia and third only behind the US and Brazil in terms of total cases globally. But for more than two weeks now, India has reported the most infections daily compared to any other country. Experts say a resurgence in cases in some states because of lockdown measures being relaxed is to be blamed. Despite this, the government plans to further open up the economy. Reports suggest metro services will be the next to resume operations starting September. Neha Punya, New Delhi. Los Angeles officials plan to file criminal charges over recent parties held in the Hollywood Hills despite a ban on large gatherings during the coronavirus pandemic. A home reportedly rented by TikTok celebrities Bryce Hall and Blake Gray has been the site reportedly of large parties violating public health orders. Weather forecast for the Bay Area, partly cloudy skies in the morning, then sunny, highs in the 70s to lower 80s around the Bay continued problems with air quality due to the wildfires in Fresno and the central San Joaquin Valley, sunny, hazy highs in the upper 90s. I'm Eileen Alfandari. We're News 94.1 with headlines at noon. Join us at 6 for the Pacifica Evening News. And we're back. This is A Rude Awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. Many folks are concerned. Many folks are concerned about genetically engineered salmon. Um, it's already happening in contained spaces. Uh, there's a couple of farms in Indiana where that is happening, but uh, there's a huge concern with those genetically engineered salmon getting out into the wild. And I was able to track down a professor of, uh, let's see here, looks like a professor of biotechnology and genomics or genomics at UC Davis. And her name is Dr. Allison Van Enenam. And uh, her research explores the use of genetic biotechnologies in agricultural systems. And she's also worked on transgenic salmon. Uh, professor Van Enenam, thank you so much for being on A Rude Awakening and opening our eyes to what's really going on with these uh, ge salmon. <laughs> All right. Well, thanks for inviting me on, Sabrina. I appreciate the opportunity to talk about this. Absolutely. So let's start with uh, let's start with the basics. What's the difference between genetically modified salmon and wild salmon? So this particular example that we're talking about is actually a um, genetically uh, engineered salmon that was produced over 30 years ago now. So it's uh, an Atlantic salmon 
that is carrying an extra gene that basically makes it get to market weight in about half the time of a conventional um, Atlantic salmon. In other words, it grows faster. It doesn't grow bigger. It just gets to market weight in about 18 months instead of 30 months. And it does it, therefore, um, needing less feed per kilogram of gain or pound of gain. Um, And it was produced... Um, in a university in uh, Canada in, in actually 1989, if you can believe it. And since then, it's been passed from generation to generation using just natural breeding. Um, and it's been going through the regulatory process for uh, a number of years and uh, has had approval in both Canada and the United States now. As it is actually the first genetically engineered animal product that's been approved for food consumption in those two countries. I see. So, And why do this? I mean, uh, we've already got the wild salmon that's out there. Uh, a lot of folks elect to, um, to consume wild salmon as opposed to genetically modified salmon. So why is there this push to, to even create genetically modified salmon? Well, so the Atlantic salmon, of course, are um, different species to the wild salmon. So the wild salmon that you're probably alluding to is the Pacific salmon, um, and that's like Alaskan fishermen go and catch those. Um, But the Atlantic salmon is actually a very big import into the United States. It's being raised in ocean-based net pens in countries like Scotland and Chile and gets blown in here. Um, And the advantage of the basically um, the the genetically engineered um, Atlantic salmon is that it can be grown in the United States. And specifically, it's being grown in just actually one farm in Indiana. And there it's actually raised in recirculating fresh water systems. And so it's 100% isolated from um, the the wild populations of Atlantic salmon or, or wild salmon. And because it can get to market weight in half the time, it's it's more... Um, feed efficient or fuel efficient, if you will. I guess it's a little bit like asking, well, you know, why do you want a a Prius um, when we've got lots of Cadillacs running around? And it's like, well, because it's a more efficient way to to kind of produce that product um, Mm -hmm. rather than flying it in from overseas. And that's really the the advantage of um, this type of a system. I see. I see. Well, that makes a lot of sense. But and then also we were talking off mic. We were speaking off mic and um, folks that are that are really, really, really upset about uh, genetically modified salmon and and what if it starts to interbreed. Um, Talk about the difference between those two, Uh, that what's being bred in the farms as opposed to what's actually out there swimming in our oceans. (laughs) Right. Well, as I mentioned, this particular fish is a is an Atlantic salmon, and um, that's different again to the the wild Pacific salmon that we have uh, mm-hmm. off the coast of California. And those are actually um, a genus uh, known as Oncorhynchus, whereas uh, Atlantic salmon are a whole different genus altogether. They're Selmo cellar, and they cannot interbreed with the with the wild Pacific salmon. They um, and additionally, this particular fish is being raised, as I mentioned, in land based recirculating systems in Indiana, mm-hmm. uh, and is being raised as a triploid all female population, um, and that really eliminates the possibility of them having the opportunity to ever even interact with any wild salmon, be they Pacific salmon or Atlantic salmon. And so um, the containment that's in place really precludes that particular concern because they really have no opportunity to basically interact with wild salmon. Okay, got it, got it. So it's like cats and dogs, basically. They, they, well, they can't do it. Well, yeah, and I... <laughs> More, yeah, more. I mean, if you want to get into the nitty gritty, the species of, of salmon, the Atlantic salmon, are a different genus to the Pacific salmon. And so it's like, you know, dogs and cats are different genuses. So dogs mm-hmm. are Canis familiaris and cats are Felis catus. And you don't need to worry about them interbreeding when you're at work. Um, and the same with these particular um, fish. They're, they're different genuses. And so therefore they, they aren't 
um, reproductively compatible with each other. Right. So that is important. Very, very, very important to break that down, drill down on it, and make sure everybody understands what the difference is between the two. Now, are there any health risks in, in consuming genetically modified salmon? Have there? I mean, this has been going on for 30 years, like you already said. Um, have there been any in reported health risks as far as um, the consumption of genetically modified uh, salmon? Yeah, so there's, there's no difference in the actual product itself. So that, as I mentioned, the fish are, are more fuel efficient, but mm-hmm. the product composition and taste and everything, um, when compared to conventional salmon, uh, has been shown to be uh, no different. And so there's really um, nothing. It's really the, the advantage of being able to grow it in, a, in this recirculating um, land-based system is, is and, and basically produce this type of salmon locally. Um, and it, it removes it from some of the concerns with uh, net pen based salmon production in, in um, Scotland and uh, those countries because you can have um, in these open net pens, you can have interaction with the, with the farmed fish and the wild fish. And there are things like um, these nasty things called sea lice that can infect uh, the fish that are being raised in net pens. And basically, by bringing them on shore, you're able to protect them from those types of parasites and diseases. And so it can be uh, raised in a much more biosecure uh, situation than you can have in the ocean, open ocean. And that uh, has a lot of advantages for the, for the farmers that's growing those fish. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm, absolutely. Okay, so uh, there is this battle going on, and if I can take you out, take off your science hat for just a second. Uh, again, we're talking <laughs> Dr. Allison Van Enenem, and she is a, the, an ex- extension specialist in animal biotechnology and genomics, or genomics, depending on part of the country you're from, at UC Davis, where her research explores the use of genetic biotechnologies in agricultural systems, and she has also worked on transgenic salmon. And... Uh, I just want to get your opinion on the the fight right now that's going on, the political side of um, the the fight against genetically modified salmon and different uh, it going to the tables of Americans. Um, a lot of folks are against it, um, and it sounds to me like there isn't much of an issue with it. I would love to have someone uh, speak to this issue uh, who is speaking against it. Um, it sounds like you're pretty neutral, if not for it. So if you don't mind, if that's okay, we want to talk about that side of things as far as uh, the, the fight against genetic modified genetically modified salmon yeah Mm -hmm. i mean i think more generally there's been pushback against genetically modified anything um for Mm -hmm. 20 or 30 years now Mm -hmm. um and i think that it's been very frustrating it's hard for me to take my science hat off because Mm -hmm. um, when Mm -hmm. you do look at the data associated with these applications um there's some real benefits associated with things like um fast growth or insect protected crops that um have kind of got lost in this whole debate around the genetically engineered fish. And so, you know, groups uh, tried to stop the commercial or the approval of this fish by basically making up a whole bunch of misinformation about it and suggesting there were food safety concerns. And it's just so much easier to scare people than it is to reassure them with science and data. And it's almost a bit of a, a, you know, a no-win situation. But I guess, you know, in this particular case, we're talking about a very small company. I think they're projecting they're going to make something like, um, oh, I think... 1,200 metric tons of salmon a year, um, and that's versus the 400,000 metric tons that we import annually from um, the the ocean net pen based uh, Atlantic salmon rearing. And it's really it's like less than what well, well under one percent of the salmon that will be produced in the United that that will be eaten in the United States annually. Um, and I, I think, you know, here is a technology being applied to try to produce a fish more sustainably with a lower environmental footprint. Um, mm-hmm. And it is not being, you know, using all that transportation greenhouse gas to fly it in from Scotland. It's being produced uh, in a way that is actually has a better feed efficiency. In other words, kilogram of feed to kilogram of gain. Um, and if we want to eat 
salmon, this is actually a pretty sustainable way to raise it. And I think those trade-offs are often kind of absent from the discussion around genetic engineering. There tends to just be, um, you know, this incessant focus on unrealized risks rather than a discussion mm-hmm. about the fact, well, we need to produce salmon. What's the best way to do it? And what are the pros and cons of different ways of doing it? And, you know, some people might prefer to um, buy wild Pacific salmon, and that's fine. That's, that's kind of almost a bit of a different product. It tends to be more expensive than Atlantic salmon. Um, mm. And if you want to eat Atlantic salmon, to me, if you're concerned about the environmental sustainability of food production, this should have some appeal to you uh, because it does fit that shared value. Um, And so those are the types of discussions that I think are really important to have because if you don't realise why, for example, this might be better than the existing system of raising Atlantic salmon, then it's easy to disregard it as being unnecessary. But actually, you know, it, it has some it has some benefits, and and we need to be open eyed about that and and discuss them um, in a in a way that isn't um, you know always kind of fear mongering and 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 um, suggesting that there's something wrong with this product. Mm-hmm. It's interesting to me, you know. We say we hear a lot of people say that you know they don't want to eat genetically engineered um, products, but you're probably familiar with the Impossible Burger, which has had tremendous commercial success, and mm-hmm. they very proudly include genetically engineered um, hemoglobin or, or leg hemoglobin. It is, but um, they're using genetically engineered products, and that hasn't um, phased consumers. And so I think sometimes that narrative that consumers reject um, genetically engineered um, products is is actually not necessarily borne out. It depends on the product and whether the consumer wants that product. And I I guess I would like to see this um, product have an opportunity for the consumer to decide whether or not they want to eat it uh, rather than just saying, no, you're not allowed to sell it because that really removes the choice of the consumer from whether they want to buy it or not. Absolutely. And I I think that's a a fair assessment. And that's coming from a scientist. (laughs) That is coming from a scientist, uh, Dr. Allison Van Enenham. Thank you so much. We truly appreciate you um, being on the show and, and just, you know, laying it out very plain, easy for folks to understand the difference between Atlantic and Pacific and wild and genetically modified salmon. And uh, I invite uh, folks to, um, if you have any questions or comments, you can email me at sabrina at kpfa.org. That's S-A-B-R-I-N-A at kpfa.org. And uh, yes, I did make an attempt to speak with uh, someone from Center for Food Safety. They have a whole campaign out against genetic modified salmon and uh, stopping uh, major stores and corporations from selling it and putting it on the tables of consumers. So that offer is still out there for someone from Center for Food Safety to contact yours truly. Um, You can just reply to the email and or phone call I made. And uh, yeah, we can take it from there. Professor, thank you so much. Thank you so much for taking the time. I know you're busy, so we appreciate you. Thank you so much. Thanks, Sabrina. Okay, we're going to switch gears and talk about the melting ice sheets in Greenland. Scientists have confirmed that there was a dramatic melting of Greenland's ice sheets in the summer of 2019. According to the journal Cryosphere, almost 96% of the ice sheet underwent melting at some time in 2019, compared with an average of just over 64% between 1981 and 2010. Folks, did you hear that? Almost 96% of the ice sheet underwent melting in Greenland. At some time in 2019, what is going on here? What does it mean? Well, you know what? Since all that ice, those glaciers sit on actual landmass, we're talking about sea level rise rolling in Greenland. So here to talk about it is 
Dr. Tyler Sutterly, and uh, he is a research associate at the University of Washington, where his research focuses on change in ice mass and ice volume of the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets. And uh, Dr. Sutterly, this sounds scary. Am I sounding the alarm for no reason, or is this this, this the great thing to do? It is scary. 2019 was a bad year in Greenland. Mm -hmm. Uh, Like you mentioned, most of the surface of the Greenland ice sheet showed melt. That's comparable to 2012 when there was a period of time when 99% of the surface showed melt. Mm -hmm. And these regions deep in the interior of Greenland shouldn't be melting. It's cold there. Mm -hmm. But we've been seeing it more and more. And uh, when we do what I do, which is measuring the mass and volume of Greenland, we're seeing that we're having uh, increasing changes over decade-type time scales, so more and more ice year by year by year uh, being lost into the ocean. And like you said, how this affects us here in the United States is sea level rise. So taking a bunch of ice and throwing it into the sea is going to raise our sea levels. And mm-hmm. if you're in areas such as Florida or Louisiana or marshlands, little tiny changes in sea level can mean a lot of land loss. Mm -hmm. Um, Greenland is the second largest uh, land ice form on Earth uh, after Antarctica. Antarctica is enormous. Greenland also has a bunch of ice. If all of it melted, sea levels would be seven meters higher. We're not expecting that, but right now we're seeing about a millimeter per year being added from Greenland alone. Some years it's a little less than a millimeter. 2019 was more than a millimeter. And so we are basically taking a bunch of data from airplanes and satellites and ships and everywhere we can get it to basically give Greenland a checkup. And Mm -hmm. like you mentioned Greenland is not doing well. It's not healthy. Mm-hmm. And it's mm-hmm. taking this global coalition of space scientists and oceanographers and biologists and people on the ice sheet, including uh, a friend of who was my PhD advisor, Connie Stefan, who just died recently uh, mm-hmm. on the ice. All of us trying to put together these pictures and seeing how well we compare. Um, There's a big international uh, collaboration movement called INDI, the Ice Sheet Mass Balancing and Comparison Exercise, which I was a part of, um, where we take everyone's estimates, see how well we compare, just so that for all of our doctors from around the world giving a similar prognosis on what's happening in Greenland. And Mm -hmm. a lot of us are really putting together a similar picture, Greenland is losing mass. It's losing more and more mass per year. Mm -hmm. And if this continues, then we're going to have more and more sea level rise as time goes on. Well, this is very, very scary. And and may your colleague rest in power. May they rest in power. Uh, Sorry to hear that. Um, Now we're talking about uh, uh, the... The, the land itself, uh, Greenland isn't doing well. Uh, we're talking about the sea rise or the sea level rise because of that ice turning into water and filling into uh, filling up the oceans. Um, what is causing that? Uh, I think one of the main things that we need to be taken into consideration is the fact that uh, the, the Earth has gotten warmer. So a lot of that warm air from Europe has moved, it started blowing towards Greenland or moving it up even more uh, towards Greenland and, and just making it hotter there. Is that correct? So Greenland is warming there's uh the arctic as a whole is warming much faster than the rest of the globe right Uh, that is due to a number of different processes one of them is just that snow and ice are a lot brighter than the ocean or the land underneath so if you lose the snow then you're going to have a darker surface which is going to absorb a lot more light and when it's absorbing a lot more solar energy then the region around it gets warmer. And so as we lose ice, we actually start warming up the region more and more, 
which can lead to more ice loss. That's known as Arctic amplification, and it's one of the reasons why the Arctic is warming something like three to eight times faster than the rest of the globe, depending on where you're looking. And there are some weather phenomena that are happening in Greenland that can lead to more ice loss in some years versus others. Um, in 2019, yes, there was some warm air coming up from mid-latitudes that led to a massive ice loss. There's a lot of complications, and one of them is clouds. Clouds can lead to warming. Clouds can lead to cooling, depending on how thick the clouds are, um, if they're reflecting light up, if they're uh, keeping us warm. Uh, in California, sometimes when you have a cloudy night, you have a, a much warmer night than if you had a cloud-free night. And that mm -hmm. happens uh, due to infrared radiation. It's mm -hmm. basically um, the greenhouse gas effect as water is a major greenhouse gas. And that can happen not just in California. It happens globally. But when you have an ice sheet, clouds can be a complicating factor. And so one of the reasons why it's hard to predict what's going to happen to Greenland early on in the season is we don't know if how clouds are going to affect Greenland on a given year, even mm -hmm. if we think we know what the temperature might be. Um, but it is getting warmer in Greenland. And that is leading to melting of the ice. And Greenland is also losing mass, not just from melt, but it is shifting more and more ice to the sea. Uh, one of the major glaciers in Greenland is Jakobshavn. And Jakobshavn is believed to have discharged the iceberg that sank the Titanic. And Jakobshavn is hmm. one of the fastest glaciers on the planet. It is rapidly retreating um, and pulling itself further and further away from where it was decades ago. And as it has pulled backwards, it is losing more and more ice. Hmm. And if this continues, then not only is Greenland going to be melting, which is the dominant form of how Greenland is losing ice right now, but we're going to have more and more icebergs being created from Greenland. And mm -hmm. big uncertainty with Greenland is not really our knowledge of the processes that affect Greenland. It's how is climate change going to go into the future of what do we do as a people and as a species over the next de few decades, the centuries, that is the uncertainty that affects Greenland on the timeline for Greenland melt and Greenland ice discharge is how climate change ha occurs over the next few decades. Right. Uh, and, and I was going to shift to that, to, to climate change, to global warming, because that um, the shift in the, the north flowing air, like I was mentioning earlier, um, it, it's uh, it, that's going to affect uh, the changes in the jet streams and, and that linger mm -hmm. over over Greenland. So um, there's something that needs to be taken into consideration as far as global warming is concerned. We've gone up another degree and mm -hmm. and this is what this is where it puts us. So, um, you, Dr. Tyler Sutterly, um, and, and now with your research at the University of Washington, um, is there is there any way? I mean, some folks are saying that it's it's already too late. It's already too late to fight climate change, the climate crisis, the climate emergency. It's already too late to do anything about global warming. As far as your research, um, you're there, you're on the ground, you're, you're, you know, you're face to face, you're on the front lines. Is there, do you feel like it, there's, that we're at the 12th hour? Do you feel like this is the end or are we still at the 11th hour and there's something that we can do? There's something that can be done about it. Well, everything that we can do, we should <laughs> I wouldn't right. ever right. put it in fatalistic terms of that uh, this is all done. Mm -hmm. Greenland is melting. That mm -hmm. much is fact. But the timeline of its melt and the timeline of sea level rise is up in the air. And so if we want to be able to adapt and change our cities and change our levees and change our maps, we want to do that slowly. And so we need to do as much as possible to slow climate change down, 
to, if we can, reverse courses where possible to slow Greenland and Antarctic melt as much as possible. So mm-hmm. I would not put it in terms of this is the end. I would say we need to do as much as possible and mobilize as fast as possible to shift the curve of Greenland ice melt and Antarctic ice melt so that we can adapt and mm-hmm. so that we can prepare and so that we can build our cities and develop as a species knowing what will happen. We don't want to shift into catastrophic anything. We're going into the geologic record when there was more ice on the planet 10, 15, 20,000 years ago. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Absolutely, absolutely. And folks, once again, speaking to Dr. Tyler Sutterly. Dr. Tyler Sutterly is a research associate at the University of Washington, where his research focuses on change in ice mass and ice volume of the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets. And I'm so glad that you were able to end things on a hopeful note. Um, I do bring the doom and gloom. <laughs> so it's nice to have that balance that uh, yes all hope is not lost all hope is not lost um, just because we've got some bad news to deliver at this moment Um, is there anywhere that folks can get information about uh, your research in particular and just about uh, the uh, melting of the glaciers in general that you could refer to our, our, our listeners so there's a few resources that I would point to before I came to the University of Washington I was a postdoctoral fellow uh, for NASA. And NASA has a lot of great resources, one of which is climate.nasa.gov. They have, a, for you to see the changes in Greenland um, measured by some very wonderful instruments. Uh, one of them is called GRACE, which is the Gravity Recovering Climate Experiment. GRACE is measuring our global gravity field month by month by month. And what that gives us is direct pictures of Greenland ice melt by these changes in gravity. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Everything that has mass exerts gravity. And so by measuring gravity, you measure mass. There's mm-hmm. also another satellite that I work with a lot now called ISAT-2. ISAT-2 is what we call a laser altimeter. It's firing a laser pulse at our planet 10,000 times a second, measuring the surface, measuring change. And so we're seeing glaciers at very high uh levels of detail by this great instrument that came up in 2018. And so going to climate.nasa.gov gives you these tremendous resources. You can be the scientist yourself and look at the data and come up with the conclusions yourself just by seeing the data yourself. Um, another website that I'll go to is uh, the ISAT2 website, um, which is isat 2 dot gffc for Goddard Space Flight Center dot nasa dot gov. Uh, that is a lot of detail about this really wonderful instrument that uh, was launched just a couple of years ago. There's a lot of um, multimedia and graphics and explaining on how we know what we know using these instruments. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. Um, for my particular research, I'm at the Applied Physics Laboratory. And so if you go to APL dot Washington.edu, that gives information on uh, what I do here at uh, UW. And there's a lot of great scientists here looking at Greenland and Antarctic from the very small scale to very big, looking at uh, what's happening in the ocean, looking at what's happening with sea ice, looking at all these different pictures. And so there's a lot that's happening here at UW. There's a lot that's happening at NASA. And like I said, Science is really collaborative and it's taking a lot of us to put our minds together and our data together to put these pictures and come up with what is happening, uh, how well do we know it, and if we can figure out how well we know it, we can figure out what we can do about it. That is wonderful to hear. All right, folks, climate.nasa.gov, climate.nasa.gov. And you should be able to break it all down there and uh, put in whatever it is you want to find out about Greenland and other glacier bodies uh, here on our planet. Again, 
Dr. Tyler Sutterly. Dr. Tyler Sutterly is a research associate at the University of Washington, where his research focuses on change in ice mass and ice volume of the Greenland and Antarctic ice sheets. Dr. Sutterly, thank you so much, so much for being on A Morning Awaken. Switching gears once again and closing out the show, talking about those wildfires, which are due to the dramatic changes to our climate. They have given rise to more out-of-control wildfires here in California. The personnel to fight those fires is stretched thin this year, even with our prison population employed to help out because of COVID-19. But what about that prison population trained to fight these fires? Some are calling it indentured servitude. And that is what the latest article by investigative environmental journalist Steve Horn is about, entitled Reformers Aim to End Prison Firefighters, Indentured Servitude in California, and it is featured on the Real News Network website. He started our conversation describing the history of prison labor. You really have to go back to the origins of the settlement of the state itself by the European uh, colonialists, in this case the Spanish colonialists, and um, you know the, the missions that took place, and if you look at what was happening on those missions, there's a really important paper that came out in 2019 uh, by Professor Benjamin Madley from UCLA, and it's titled California's First Mass Incarceration System. It really lays out, and, and it's interesting, his paper points to the camps, uh, the, the fire camps, as a, kind of like a latter-day version of what, he's, what he goes into in his history. But the history of his paper is, exactly the mechanics of how these missions worked and you know basically he frames it as this was more or less a form of incarceration or potentially slavery or kind of kind of like a blend of the two and that that is um like there was a lot of important labor that was done in those places agricultural production um I mean, that would be the main thing, agricultural, whether it's, um, you know, the, like uh, through livestock or through uh, you know, other kinds of foods. So I think that that's important. And, and, and obviously, I just want to point out that um, his paper points out that uh, 60, 66, over 66,000 people died in those, those camps. So it was not only was it, um, I'm sorry, in the mission, so not only was it, compelled labor basically but it was it was deadly and lethal and basically you know tantamount to a genocide which is kind of well known at this point in in the in the history books of, of what the the spanish colonials did to the indigenous population of the state but then you fast forward into kind of like not the, the first year of the state we'll talk about statehood now in the 1850s and that is where you get something a little bit more kind of similar to what we have now which is always even from the first prisons in the state and they're still open today Folsom state prison and san quentin state there was always versions of labor uh and you know poorly paid basically almost akin to slave labor uh that was associated with being in those prisons um you know i'm not sure how i'll compare it to today i don't really know because today you kind of have the choice if you want to do that labor, I'm not sure how, how much of a choice you had back then. Um, but you know, I'm, I'm not sure if it was like a hundred percent that you had to do this work, but that gets into the indentured servitude versus slavery debate, which we, we can talk about, but kind of the, the, the long story short is in these prisons, they were doing key things like building dams, building a one-on-one freeway, projects, yeah, a one-on-one yeah. freeway, <laughs> et cetera, et cetera. Like the mm-hmm. modern, a lot of the modern infrastructure of Northern California mm-hmm. was built from these prison systems, from things that were not yet called conservation camps, but laid the groundwork for this kind of idea that those. And there was an intellectual debate over this. You know, what what is the purpose of being in prison? And there was a debate that won out. Is that you know, physical labor is meaningful. It can be kind of a version of uh, like reforming 
the person that was like the way that they sold it as a reform. But in reality, they were using these prisoners for just abysmally paid labor that they didn't have to pay others to do. And it's always been a bread and butter part of the California system. It's, if you look more broadly, it's been a bread and butter part of a lot of uh, states' mm-hmm. prison systems. But that gets mm-hmm. us into you know, the history of today, which is what mm-hmm. we know is the conservation camp started after World War II. And, and here we are. They're still really central to fighting the wildfires. You know, we, we couldn't have wildfire relief the way we do if it wasn't for prisoners. And that's opened up all kinds of debates over what kind of reform should it be abolished. And that's where we are in, here in 2020. Right, right. And I just wanted to to point out here, uh, there's an organization or a program called the Forestry and Fire Recruitment Program. And uh, this particular organization or program is addressing environmental and criminal justice reforms in California. Uh, And it states that California's wildfires are a constant, imminent threat, and there are not enough resources for initial attack and fire prevention work. Previously incarcerated firefighters deserve the opportunity to continue working professionally as wildland firefighters and fuels technicians. And this particular program is developing solutions. Um, yeah, and cultivating wildland firefighters from all walks of life. And uh, this uh, organization started uh, back in 2014, and uh, you can get more information, community. Uh, you can go online to forestryfireP.org. Um, let's talk about the legislation that's out there. Uh, Governor Brown really took a stand and signed into uh, signed into. Uh, being the, uh, the the Ventura program down in Ventura County, uh, where prisoners can be trained and uh, put into a, a regular civil servant position, um, but there was a lot of pushback, um, and it has to be said that uh, Senator Kamala Harris, when she was Attorney General, um, her office pushed back quite a bit as far as trying to. Um, uh, keep folks incarcerated so that they could be a part of the conservation camp program. And um, there's a lot that that, that goes behind that. Unfortunately, we don't have enough time. So let's go ahead and talk about the legislation. Uh, We have AB211, I think it was, and then AB2147. Now, one died, one is still alive. Talk about those two. Mm -hmm. Yeah, well, so, yeah, I'll talk just quickly, kind of just briefly mention the thing about the Ventura Training Center, which is yes. sort of um, a different model, which is a reform, which is this is one of the biggest problems besides the low pay, which no matter any of the things we're about to talk about, the low pay, when I, when I say low pay, they, these uh, men and women are being paid $2 to $5 a day um, for this work when, right. when fires are raging. So right. let me make it a little bit, you know, something maybe a little bit more when fires, I think I'm up beyond the average, I'm up a little bit more when when they're actually playing the fires. But yeah, it's very low paid work. And what the the problem is beyond just the low pay is that it's very hard, basically impossible right now to get a job in the field after if it's something you wanted to do, which, you know, when you're in prison for a long period of time and you might not be able to position yourself for jobs in the same way because you're kind of just rotting away in a prison cell. This gives you a different opportunity in which you're learning a very you know, highly sought after valued skill, especially in the state of California. You would think, well, you have these well-trained people that the state is paying to train to do this work who are you know, out in the field doing it. They might be great people to go do that job after, but the reality is once you have a felony on your record in the state of California and other places, it's basically like the scarlet scarlet letter on your chest. It's very hard to get a job. And, and what what all of these things have in common that that uh, the legislation, whether it's um, t- whether it's the Ventura Training Program Center, which is actually just uh, letting a small number in, and you're you're getting your apprenticeship, and you go into the go work for Cal Fire, but it's the criticism of that is just not enough people, but it's at least gets, it's a career path. So it's something. And it, yeah, as you said, came under contention. There are people in Ventura County and um, in the city council in uh, with Camarillo who said, you know, we, we don't want these, basically these criminals in our 
backyard kind of thing, a NIMBY situation. But yeah, Brown stood strong, included in the budget in 2018, and, and the program still exists to this day. And basically, you know, all the things that have been proposed after that, whether it's AB 1211, which is supposed to be broader, it's kind of supposed to be like a statewide version of the Ventura Training Center, like a, an apprenticeship program statewide for those who served in the, in the program. That one was very harshly opposed by the um the professional firefighters association and it didn't make it through that was last year so they're trying again right now the one that's current is called ab 2147 and what it does is it uh creates a means to expunge your criminal record um, if you serve in the program so that uh basically the, the felony that i mentioned those kind of things would not be on your record um, in the same way, um, if you're a whole court procedure you have to go through otherwise, this would just expedite that. It would kind of create a different pathway for potentially getting into this field or other fields for those who, you know, did their time and, you know, basically put their lives on the line to fight these fires. So that one is, we had, um, had passed through the assembly and now it's pending in the Senate. So it passed pretty much, I think, um, you know, Mostly, I mean, pretty mm -hmm. uh, comfortably through the assembly. If you look at the vote tally, so right. yeah, it remains to be seen what the Senate will do. Yeah, definitely. Yeah, I think it's a very interesting because Assemblymember Lois uh, Reyes, uh, she's the one that, that wrote that and put it up. And uh, there's the battle between the California Public Defenders Association, which is uh, mm -hmm. uh, given it lobbying support. And then there's also the California District Attorneys Association, who is opposing it. So that is going to, yeah, it remains to be seen. I think, I think Governor Newsom says it uh pretty well when he says um, the mm -hmm. hots are getting hotter, the dryers are getting drier. And this yes. Is, this is the reality. This is, this is climate change. If you want to yes. If you want to see climate change in <laughs> play out in real time, come to come to California is basically his message and that's true. That's that's exactly why you mm -hmm. summed it up well. That's why this um this is, is he this, I mean it sounds like a is he oh, doing God. anything? Oh, sorry, I apologize. Is he doing anything, or is he is he backing up uh, AB two one four seven at all, or has there been any reports of him uh, 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 pushing for it or lobbying for it in any way? Well, what he did, what, I mean, this is important to point out. Um, but I'll answer that in two ways. One, I haven't really seen almost any instance, and except for when it's almost across the finish line, where he weighs in on, on legislation, sort of as a general kind of in a trend I've seen where he doesn't take the lead on pushing legislation and he, he kind of like he on the stuff that he cares about he just get, kind of gets it through the the regulatory system has been the trend that i've i've, I've seen um like a good example would be ab5 the whole um, thing with the uber and the gig economy he really didn't weigh in until like the very last minute on that so but i mean that gets to the other point i was making is through the regulatory actions and the budgeting and stuff that that's where he's taking the action so this year in the budget included a hundred million extra dollars for well, it might have been more than that actually. Uh, we'll just say ballpark one hundred to two hundred million because I don't want to be wrong. But lots, you know, lots more money for hiring new people. But I, you know, the way that I saw it, more people to be in Cal Fire basically uh, to be responding to these fires. Um, and what I saw that is, if you, if you look at the numbers, it kind of coincided with the number of people that they're losing who are prisoners because of different, there's more like early release reforms in prison. And there's also COVID early release that is like because this emergency moment overcrowding in prison. So they're very, very short. It's kind of a uh, damning indictment a little bit, I would say of the, how reliant they are on this prison labor, but basically they had to pony up the money and say, well, they didn't ever say what I'm saying, but, Essentially, if you follow the money, they're they're saying, well, this was the money that we were saving. Now we have to spend it and hire more people. So that's the action he's taken is hiring more people. He's never framed it as I'm hiring more people because of this prison situation. Although sometimes people have asked him about the prison situation. He, he's just never been explicit enough to tie it to together because it wouldn't be, I would say it wouldn't be a good look. But I just want to mention one of the things I found in my article was when I was looking around, it, the the most the biggest wildfires back in 
2018, the year of the, the campfire and um, some of the other huge ones that happened that year, uh, the one in Sonoma County. The right before that started, <laughs> the um, the, the Department of uh, their, their Cal Fire their, their um, for the conservation camp program. It used to say this saves us 100 million dollars a year um, on their website. They, they kind of touted that this is a money saving thing. Now that that right before that wildfire season would have been August of 2018, they or maybe July they they changed the uh, the website and they don't they no longer talk about money savings. But if you look at the amount of money that was put forward just recently by Newsom, it was like kind of matches up pretty well if you look at that old website. So definitely, I think they're realizing that there's a clamoring for a want for changing this program, and they're either gonna they're gonna have to find a pipeline those who served and, um, you know, basically put up money to pay people to do this job for a living. No doubt. No doubt. Yeah. It's a, it's, it's not, I guess it's not political, politically expedient right now for, uh, for Newsom to, to take a stand on it. But, um, yeah, I, just like you said, it's a, this isn't going to get any better. That's just like we're saying, it's not going to get any better. So he's going to have to take a stand at some point. <laughs> sooner, Absolutely. And, and sooner in California, it's important to mm-hmm. point out, I mean, a huge state has the most just because of the size of the state and mm-hmm. how all over the state the wildfires are geographically. Definitely, they're not the only Western state to have these kind of programs, but it's definitely the the biggest for the number of people and the most fires. So, yeah, it's, it's not going away anytime soon. And I think that that's why it's kind of forced the hand on these, you know, the 2147, for example. And maybe if it doesn't pass, it'll something, maybe there'll be something next year. This is obviously a very strange year because of COVID-19. And they, they keep going into session and out of session with people contracting the virus. So wow. who knows what happens. But, yeah, I know, I know the Senate just... Um, the one, you know, the, the chamber that has to pass until the Senate just dismissed itself again because of someone getting COVID-19. So we'll, we'll see what happens. But it's Man. crazy times in the legislature. Absolutely. Crazy times in this world. Well, we're going to go ahead and wrap it up. Steve, Steve Horn, Steve Horn, Real News Network investigative reporter on the environmental tip. You've done it again, my friend. You've done it again. <laughs> <laughs> Thank appreciate you. Yeah, appreciate it. Yes, I'm, I'm. I'm so sorry I had to pull you out of your uh, your editing mode and and to to get this story. But uh, yeah, it was worth it. <laughs> I really appreciate you taking the time, and uh, you know I'm going to be bugging in your very near future. Appreciate you, Steve. Thank you so much for being on a Rude Awakening once again. My pleasure. And just want to direct folks to the Real News Network website, realnews.com, realnewsnetwork.com. And you can check that out, that piece by Steve Horn, investigative environmental journalist for them. And that does it for another edition of A Rude Awakening. I'm Sabrina Jacobs. A big thank you to my guests, Dr. Allison Van Enenum, Dr. Tyler Sutterly, and Steve Horn for taking the time. Always Real Rodakiel is on the controls. I'll be back next week. Same time, same place. Stay tuned for the best Friday lineup on radio. Coming up next, a rebroadcast of Democracy Now! And of course, folks, don't forget to embrace each other as we embrace the mother of us all. Thank you so much for listening. Registered to vote? Are you sure? You can find out in 30 seconds at vote.org. They'll check your registration status or register you. At vote.org, you can request an absentee ballot and get election reminders like this one. Make sure you vote early so that your vote gets counted. Pass on vote.org to your family and friends across the country. Make sure you exercise your right. A 2020 election reminder from KPFA. 
I'm Sonali Kohatkar, host of Rising Up with Sonali, which airs Monday through Friday at 3 p.m. on KPFA. Our program begins each broadcast with our daily news headlines, bringing you the latest breaking news, followed by in-depth conversations with analysts and newsmakers. On Rising Up with Sonali, you get progressive analysis of the news rooted in gender, racial, economic and social justice. Join me every weekday at 3 p.m. on 94.1 KPFA. Hi, I'm CS, co-host of Against the Grain. After months of precautions, lockdowns, and social distancing, coronavirus cases and hospitalizations are spiking in the Bay Area. In times like these, it's KPFA's duty, our community-minded duty, to remind listeners to stay vigilant about wearing masks, washing hands, and doing social distancing. We all want to return to normal, but first, we need to stay alive. Be safe, be smart, and thanks for listening to KPFA. You're listening to 94.1 KPFA, 89.3 KPFB in Berkeley, 88.1 KFCF in Fresno, 97.5 K248BR in Santa Cruz, and online worldwide at kpfa.org.